Hi, this is Kyle Sofikowski, and in this video, we're going to be reviewing what brings about the Industrial Revolution, which is going to also bring about the Gilded Age following the Civil War, which is going to be marked by pronounced changes that we're going to get into right now. So some of the big period six ideas. One, while the United States is going to be heavily transformed from one from being an agriculturally based society to one that's going to be much more industrialized, you're going to be seeing the rise of factories and you're going to be seeing significant growth of cities in urban areas. You're also going to see significant changes in the economic, political, diplomatic, social, environmental, as well as cultural realms. This is a time uh, period that you're going to just see the United States go from night to day. And a lot of this is due to the Industrial Revolution. And as this is going to happen, this is going to create eventually what's called, called a Gilded Age. This is a term that is coined by Mark Twain, where it defines a time of serious social problems in the late 1800s that's masked by a thin gold lining. So if you see anything that's gilded, right, it's, it's golden. But really what masks underneath it, right, under that neat, that thin gold lining is a lot of social problems in this case. So here you see uh, this political cartoon where you're going to see just the privileged few, which is going to be on the backs of the working class. So we're going to see a number of uh, problems with the working class. And of course, this is going to give rise to unions, of course. So going industrial. So after the Civil War, as we know, we're going away from an agriculturally based society. Think about Thomas Jefferson and sort of his vision with the Democratic Republicans envisioning sort of an agricultural based society for the common person. Well, that's sort of going to go to the wayside in favor of an industrial world. Remember what the Federalists wanted uh, in the North, and you're going to see the Northeast in particular defining the industrial age. We're going to see a, hum a hum huge economic rather uh, post-Civil War boom. And you're going to see natural resources invention are going to be significant, such as with the rise of factories and machines towards supporting this industrial revolution. So why? Well, there are some political factors here. In particular, you have the Morrell Tariff, which was passed uh, right around the Civil War. And these were protective uh, tariffs. So the United States is really trying to protect itself or more in the Northeast. And of course, that the South is not going to be all that favorable towards these tariffs, but you're going to see growth within, purchase domestic instead of foreign. So these tariffs are going to encourage Americans to purchase the cheaper goods that are made in the United States because the outside goods, the imports, are going to be levied with tariffs, which are going to be more expensive. You also see the National Banking Act, which is going to create a uniform national bank note. This is going to be very important with respect to currency, and it's going to help to streamline the economic system in the United States. On top of this, you're going to see the promotion of laissez-faire economics. And this is really where you have a free market with very minimal government intervention, where really there's very little uh, government regulation. So for example, you're going to see the rise of child labor, you know, kids sometimes as young as five or six, because there was no law against it. Sort of the government is hands off and is stepping back and basically letting the market dictate prices, letting bosses do whatever they want, because there really are no laws. And this is going to define the Gilded Age. So some of the economic factors along with this is you're going to have a number of natural resources, everything from the rise of steel, coal in particular, which is going to be important for fuel. But you will notice based on this map that a lot of this area is going to be in the northeast. You're not going to see the south really captivating uh, the economic system by any means or, you know, playing a major role to that extent. It's going to be heavily concentrated in the Northeast. You're also going to see more capital in terms of money available, cheaper labor, uh, technology. You're going to see the rise of better transportation, in particular the railroad. And then you're going to, of course, see the rise of the steel industry, which is going to be very important, as I'll get into momentarily. So some of the major you know, resources, we're going to see oil, which is going to have a significant use by the 1840s, that, of course, being kerosene and then later gasoline, very important for fuel. Also coal, and then, of course, you're going to see that 
you know, take coal, coal and oil together, this is going to make much more industry. But of course, the people who are mining coal in particular, it's not going to be all that favorable for working conditions if you know anything about coal mines. But uh, look at some of the significant coal deposits. You're going to see, of course, in the Black Hills region, also the Appalachian region. Those are going to be major uh, areas where coal is going to be concentrated. And then, of course, oil everywhere from present-day Texas um, and even a little bit into uh, western Pennsylvania. And you even see it in the uh, west as well. And again, once uh, in the Black Hills and the, in the uh, Dakotas. And then with uh, steel, this is going to be important because it's going to be stronger. It's going to be lighter. It's going to be even better than iron. And you're going to see the rise of uh, the Bessemer process. This was important because this made iron turned into steel. And uh, it's going to be useful for constructing buildings and bridges. It's going to be quite significant. And this is going to be important as you're going to see it even being used for railroads and skyscrapers as well. You could really make the argument that you know the Industrial Revolution would not have been possible without steel because you need to build all these things for transportation, factories, and ultimately it's the steel that's going to make it very uh, basically possible for that to occur. And if you look at, of course, steel, uh, where it is found, you'll see a lot of it in western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, uh, known as, of course, the Rust Belt here. And uh, if you, you know, are into football, that's why, of course, you have the Steelers in Pennsylvania. And then, you, of course, you're going to have the rise of inventions, in particular, of course, Edison's light bulb and electricity. With more electricity, you can now, you know, it means for more factories. And it means, you know, not just working during daylight hours. Now you can work overnight as well. You're also going to see production being moved away from the home, known as the cottage system, to factories. And again, once you introduce machines, you're going to have mass production that is going to really, really take off and, you know, lead to a bigger size of the American market. But perhaps what's most, uh, you know, amazing is when you look at the railroads, uh, I believe this one was in uh, the 1870s, the Transcontinental Railroad. But if you look at just how the federal government is involved with land grants to the railroads, uh, quite significant, as you can see here, um, that the railroad industry was heavily subsidized uh, by the federal government, which is trying to produce and promote an a interconnected uh, railroad system. But if you look in the, you know, 1870s here, and then compare this to the 1890s. I mean, wow, that's quite a development. You know, not no longer just going to San Francisco, Salt Lake, and Denver. I mean, now you have this going all over the place. And uh, with that, you're going to note that you're going to have time zones. Actually, time zones are a product of the railroad uh, system because that's going to allow schedules to be maintained at the same time. And with this, you're going to have the rise of westward expansion. You're going to see uh, the government, again, giving out loans uh, as well as land grants, one of them coming from the Pacific Railroad Acts of 1862. And that promotion, you, you just see it right here in 1865, 35,000 miles of track. By the year 1900, less than 45 years later, you have 192,000 miles. And here you see the Transcontinental uh, Railroad meeting up the east and the west and uh, quite a magnificent achievement. Now, when you have this national network of rails, uh, you're going to see, of course, as we said during the Civil War, you have the Transcontinental Railroad, which is, of course, bolstering the Union. And you're going to see, uh, you know, the companies, in particular Union Pacific, granted 20 square miles of land for each mile of track. So that's a quite a significant number. And again, as we said before, that the Central Pacific and Union Pacific are going to meet up uh, in this place, uh, Utah. But it, of course, is not without its detriments as they're going to be a high death toll. In particular, you're going to see the rise of Chinese and Irish immigrant labor that's going to be absolutely paramount to the construction of the railroad system. But you're also going to see a very high death toll as well. And of course, the United States is not going to stop there. You're going to have another four by the turn of the century. So quite significant uh, as you're going to see this. So with that, you're going to have rail towns growing out. This is going to promote trade. You're going to have interdependence. And you're even going to see iron, coal, steel, lumber in the glass industries also significantly increasing because now you can move these in a much more rapid pace. So the railroad is going to be very important here. And as I said to you before, you're going to have the adoption of uh, standard time zones thanks to the railroad system trying to keep the rail schedule straight. But without a doubt, the rails are going to be transforming the country. However, there was a little bit of an over-optimism of the rail builders. 
The problem is, yes, you can create as many railroad tracks as you want, but you're going to see a number go bankrupt because if you're going from nowhere to nothing, right? I mean, you see some of these areas or land in the West, there's really inhabited. There's not much there. You know, people have no reason to go, you know, all the way out West um, in, the, in these small railroad towns. So you're going to see a number of bankruptcy, particularly uh, after 1893. Uh, in particular, when we get into the robber barons and the gospel of wealth, uh, Vanderbilt in particular is going to be very important in taking advantage of this in terms of consolidating a lot of the railroads. But we'll, of course, get into that a little bit later. The main takeaway here is that railroads are going to be revolutionizing the transportation of goods throughout the United States. You're going to be connecting cities, as you see here on the bottom right. Uh, it's quite significant as many cities across the country are now going to be connected. And of course, it's going to be promoting migration. So you know, the railroads, of course, are a large part of industrialization. You're going to see, of course, the rise of raw materials. But also don't forget about the plight of the working class, which is going to give rise to labor unions, which we'll cover in a subsequent video.